Hey everyone, I see that you are connecting to audio. Um, just wanted to say thanks for showing up today. Excited to chat with you more and, and introduce Riley soon. Um, yeah, I mean, for a lot of you, I imagine you're here because you're interested in sustainable development. Um, you're interested in sustainability. Uh, maybe you're an engineer, environmental science, construction science, management. Um, I'll introduce myself in a second, but just wanted to say thanks again for attending. I'm glad that you're interested in sustainability uh, and that you are trying to learn about travel and other cultures. That's awesome. You're on a great path and a great road. So thanks for joining us. Uh, it's going to be fun. We're going to keep it interactive. Um, if you want to have your video on, I know that for me, at least during COVID, uh, you know, a lot of times I crave being close to people. So feel free to have your video on, opt into that and uh, totally okay. If not, and you want to show in the background, awesome. But if you don't have your video on, you got to ask a question at the end. That's a requirement. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Let's start this video and then we'll get going with the rest of uh, today's talk. So thanks again. Sam, I see you're fishing. I'm loving that vibe, man. Thank you so much for bringing us along. But uh, yeah, here's the video, everyone. Uh, real quick, do you mind if we record this? Uh, yeah, we are actually recording, so I'll send it to you at the end. Great, thank you. Awesome, no problem, Anthony. Sweet. Uh, yeah, again, for people who joined a second later, if you want to see that video, I can always send it to you. Um, but again, thanks everyone for joining us today. Just so excited that you care about education, sustainability, adventure. Um, yeah, my name is Chad. A little bit more about what the green program looks like. If you have questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat um, and we'll answer them all at the end. Um, if my internet might be a little bit slow, so bear with me for a sec. Sweet. All right, I think I'm all caught up. Yeah, as I mentioned, my name is John Rick. I work at the Green Program. Here, I'm sort of in charge of these things, giving you all the information about programs, handing you all the resources, and doing outreach like this so that people like you can find out about what the Green Program is and what we do. Um, basically, this sort of photo of me here and how I sort of found myself at the Green Program started during my time studying abroad in Thailand. And as you can see, I'm actually in a village in Northern Thailand and I was studying the political ecology of forests. And so basically there are indigenous people, uh, especially we just had indigenous people's day the other day. Um, and yeah, basically they're living in the national parks there, able to do so, they're taking care of the forest. And so part of my job as a student was to go and learn about what does sustainable development look like in these communities? How are they living there? And something that really helped me sort of analyze was sort of my own perspectives of sustainable development, of how I thought people should live and how they should develop. 
You have a lot of people in these villages that are experiencing brain drain as the, as the young people leave the village and go to a city. So they have that urbanization. Um, so it's all just super intersectional. And I felt like with that, I was able to analyze my own background, my own biases, and really be able to understand from more local perspective how they wanted to develop. Um, and I did that over four months. It was an incredible experience. It got me really excited that I actually went back. I lived in Thailand for two, three years. I was teaching sustainable development, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about that in the future. Um, but you didn't all come to hear me talk about Thailand. You came to hear about the Green Program in Riley. Um, and so, yeah, Riley, I'll pass the mic over to you. Can you introduce yourself for everyone? Tell them the fun facts, who you are, uh, what you're doing at Clemson. Yeah, jump in, man. Yeah, what's up, guys and girls? I guess there's a couple girls in here. But um, I'm a construction science major. Uh, I'm a senior this year. I'll be graduating uh, next December, not May. I have to take capstone class in the uh, summer. But you'll hear a little bit about uh, Green Programs capstone that they have as well in their program. Um, I got into traveling probably like 2011. Uh, I went to Canada for a little bit with this program called uh, People to People. I don't know if some of you have heard of it or may have traveled with them. Um, I also went uh, to Europe to a couple of different countries in 2013. Um, and since I've done that travel, um, it sparked my interest in travel and culture abroad in general. And then I got an email about the green program, probably from John. I'm not sure if it was from you or from Melissa. Uh, last year, um, 2019, probably like spring, uh, about the Nepal trip. It was their pilot trip, the first one to Nepal. And so I hopped on it and went over there in December and it was awesome. Um, definitely sparked my interest in sustainability. And now here I am talking to you guys. Sweet. Thanks, Riley. I'm excited to hear too about your experience in Nepal and how it compared to other places. Um, yeah, everyone, we're going to go over the programs. We're going to go over the capstone projects and obviously answer all your questions at the end. Uh, we'll talk about COVID throughout the presentation as well. So again, feel free to jump into chat and ask any questions there for us to answer at the end. But for right now, I'm curious, everyone who is on the call, please give, introduce yourself in the chat. Go ahead and write down your major. And if you were to travel to a country tomorrow, forget COVID and the pandemic, what country would you travel to? Just curious about where people are sort of interested. So yeah, again, jump into the chat there and introduce yourself, write down your major and where would you want to go to a country if you had to tomorrow? Aaron, great to meet you. I literally was about to write New Zealand. That's kind of an, like perfect timing. Uh, Samantha, so glad to have you. Construction science. Um, excited. You've also been to Thailand. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Samantha, you're, Samantha, what country do you want to go to? Jesse, great to see you. Chemical engineering. You've been to Thailand, but you would love to go to Indonesia. Me as well. That was the one country I didn't go to in Southeast Asia. Ooh, that in wow. Malaysia. Pretty excited about that. Uh, Riley, got to get you to Japan or Iceland for sure. Jacob, great to meet you. Chemical engineer. Back to Peru. Well, we'll talk about the Peru program. Hopefully this will be great. Um, David, great to meet you. Biosystems engineering, India. Yes, that would be awesome, man. Um, Anthony, great to meet you. Ireland. I'm Irish a little bit. <laughs> and I've heard it's great. Danielle, great to meet you. Environmental engineers. We have a lot of environmental engineers come on our program. Greece, Danielle, if you go there, you need to eat everything, like nonstop. It's just incredible food. I've been there before. Um, Sam, Switzerland, great to meet you. Ethan, South Africa, cool, man. Um, would love to go there as well. That's kind of on my bucket list. Zachary, good to meet you. Construction Science, glad that you're here because of Riley. Excited for you guys to connect. New Zealand, Spain or Italy, thanks, Sam. Uh, Jaden, great to meet you. Costa Rica. We actually had a program there. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Elena, Alana is great to meet you. Finland, but you are Canadian. Awesome. Um, and Jackie, electrical engineering. Thanks. We have a lot of electrical engineers. Brazil, my mom lived there for two years. Maybe that's where I got a travel bug. Not sure. And Freddie, great to meet you as well. Um, yeah, if you're interested in Southeast Asia, Freddie, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, yeah, one of you just mentioned Costa Rica. And actually, it's funny you say that because that's how the green program started. We started back in 2009. You'll see Melissa here right in the center. Melissa was on spring break with her friends in Costa Rica. 
And while they were there, you know, they were enjoying food, they were on the beach, they were enjoying a lot of the pieces of travel and culture. Um, and they ended up somehow kind of landing on the front door of a renewable wind facility. And they kind of, I don't know exactly how this happened, but got to the front door of the facility, knocked on the door, the industry professional opened the door and was just like, what, what's up, what are you doing? Uh, why are all these college kids here pretty much? And uh, this whole conversation is happening in Spanish, mind you. And uh, yeah, they basically were like, dude, we would love if you'd like to learn more about renewable energy in Costa Rica and just have a tour around this facility. Um, and yeah, that was wild. It was really cool that the person ended up saying yes, toured them around the facility. And actually, um, they ended up flying back home and they were just thinking to themselves, that was incredible. How did we go to like this facility and actually be able to get to um, do all the adventure, culture, food, travel, and learn about renewable energy in Costa Rica. So yeah, basically that's how the green program started. We've gone to all of these different locations with alumni reunions, as well as different programs. And we'll talk about the four that we are currently running. Um, but yeah, what is the green program? You'll see five words up here that sort of categorize a lot of what the green program is. So again, kind of want you all to type in the chat again, when you're thinking about travel and study abroad, which of these words sort of points out to you the most? I'm kind of curious. Are you excited about impact, culture, adventure, just travel in general, getting out of the United States or Canada, wherever you are. Um, education, maybe you're really pumped about, you know, also being able to learn while you're abroad. But yeah, if you throw it into the chat, I'm just kind of curious where people are coming from. Lots of adventure and culture. Love that. David, thanks for saying impact. I'm glad that. And Jacqueline, that's cool. Um, culture, Freddie and Danielle, you can't say adventure and culture. You had to pick one, uh, but that's all right. I don't blame you. Um, cool. So it looks like people are kind of split across the board looking at adventure, culture, um, on impact as well. It's funny no one said education, totally okay, but you know, that's part of our programs and I'm excited to brag about it and tell you why the green program is pretty great in that sense. So if you didn't know yet, we're short-term programs abroad uh, focused on sustainable development and we have a couple online programs we'll cover later. But the other really big part of what the green program sort of seeks to do is bridge this gap between textbooks and real life learning. Uh, so with all of our programs, they're focused on both the sustainable development goals as well as 21st century workforce skills. So everything we do is sort of designed with these skills that we want you to practice and get real world experience. So I imagine some of you have had internships, some of you have been able to grab some experience in some of your classes, um, but this is a new way to do it while going abroad as well. Um, but yeah, I guess maybe Riley, I'm curious, when you look at this list of skills gained in practice, do you think any of these sort of like jump out at you the most of something you learned while you were on your program in Nepal? Um, probably is going to be diversity and cultural intelligence, just because travel makes me want to learn everything about the culture in the place that I go to, such as Nepal, whether it's food, um, music, stuff like that. So we, yeah, I definitely found for me when looking at diversity and cultural intelligence, um, I now feel more confident about being able to walk into a workplace and be like, oh, people come from different backgrounds. They might look like me. They might not look like me. But now I have like this thought in my brain, which is like, how would I interact with someone in different ways because they are from different cultures? Um, and how can we actually play to that as a strength? and really be pushing that. And as you all know, like in the United States, like diversity, equity, inclusion is so important. So like moments like this, where you actually are going abroad and learning from other people is really helpful. So yeah, Riley, I'm glad that you uh, grabbed that one. Cool, here's the mission statement. I'll read it out loud because I feel like it's important. So TGP's mission is to educate and empower future sustainability leaders through innovative models of experiential education, travel, and adventure. Um, so we've already mentioned this adventure is a huge part of our programs as it's just getting you to a new place, but experiential education, you tasting it, you feeling it, you being there walking on a glacier and seeing the effects of climate change firsthand is just going to impact you more than you reading it in a book or watching a David Attenborough like documentary, which Riley and I said, we love those, but at some point, like experiencing it firsthand is great. 
speaking of that, he just released a new one on Netflix. Y'all should all go watch it. I'm in. Thanks for letting me know. I'm such a fan. Um, cool. Quick notes about what the green program is compared to other programs. So short term, we only do eight to 10 day programs. That's a really big deal uh, for a lot of people who are trying to squeeze this program in either in their winter break, spring break, summer before an internship or after an internship. Um, so that's why we exist is because we know that this is more accessible because it's short term. It's accredited as well. So you'll be getting credit from that local university, from all of your professors. Uh, I already mentioned the SDGs and career focus piece and element of the green program. Super important to us that you feel like you are growing in your ability to be a professional who is both empowered with just passion and seeing it firsthand, but also feel like you have the skills to be able to actually act on that passion. Um, accessibility, we do it over breaks, 90% less cost and time of an entire program if you were to do a semester abroad. Um, interdisciplinary, no matter what your background is, we want you in the green program as long as you care about sustainability and want to learn more. And then long-term impact, we'll talk about that later, but we have an incredible alumni network that you get entered into as well. Cool. I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of the programs. Riley has not yet been to Peru. I know someone on this call definitely has been. Um, but yeah, I'm basically going to just talk about each of these programs as if they're a case study. So as you hear me talk about them, again, throw some questions in the chat. But I'm excited to just let you know about these incredible destinations. And behind these destinations are people, communities, industry professionals, and just like the community leaders that really care about sustainable development. Um, so yeah, all of these locations really matter to us at the Green Program, and hopefully I'll be able to do it justice. But again, I'm only going to be able to give you a snippet. Uh, so yeah, Peru, what does this one focus on is water resource management. So if you're someone who cares about access to quality of water, you're thinking about gaining access for different communities in the United States and abroad, you know, what is the historical significance in Peru? How did they actually get to a place where there is accessibility and quality? And then in some other locations, there's not. So here, the two, the, the classes that we're sort of taking are surrounding like water pollution and mining, looking at hydroelectric energy, what is the future of that in Peru? So a bit of renewables here as well. We go to a wastewater treatment facility and a hydroelectric energy facility. And both of those are pretty fun, um, partially because Cusco has a lot of potential and they're in a place where they're able to grab this like historic rich area. Like it's full of all of these like diverse cultures and food. And you'll actually see right there in that middle photo there, Professor Oscar, he's, we're doing a field study on this program, looking at the irrigation systems in Machu Picchu designed by the Incans. And it actually like, can go up hills and mountains and stuff without any tools, the Incans kicked our butt, right? So they like have designed such simple methods that modern day engineers, construction science um, professionals are going to study what that looks like. So if you at all care about agriculture, how does history impact a place that develops um, or even like visiting a wastewater treatment facility? Uh, this is kind of the place to go. We have a local service project as well because we designed this program with the mayor of Cusco. And one sort of like interesting thing there was the mayor was like, yo, John, uh, we're so happy to have you in Cusco, but don't go over there. And we we're like, what? What do you mean don't go over there? Because um, we actually told by Oscar there that there's this river that runs through Cusco and it's entirely polluted from like lots of different places. So it's having coming from trash from local people, from a slaughterhouse. You just see this drain emptying out into there, medical waste. And there's a whole bunch of different reasons of why that river is polluted. And meanwhile, the wastewater treatment facility is putting water back into it. And you're scratching your head looking at these industry professionals being like, what's going on here? Why is this river still polluted? How are we not using education and policy to fix this? Turns out it's incredibly difficult to solve. And it's one of the, the problems that we dissect and pull apart. So yeah, Cusco, interested in food or water. Um, this is our most adventurous programs where we go whitewater rafting and zip lining. Um, and that's kind of an understatement. I can send you some videos, but yeah, this is kind of like the, the Peru program in a nutshell. So ask me questions at the end or throw them in the chat. Uh, I'll talk to about one more and then throw it over Riley. Japan, different case study, totally different background, culture, policy, economics, everything is different. 
So here, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the Fukushima event that happened back in 2011. There was actually a earthquake, tsunami led to a nuclear disaster. Uh, and a lot of you on this call are construction science management students, or you are engineers. And part of this program is really knowing the importance of a well-designed facility, really. Um, and how are we really thinking about nuclear power plant safety and safety in other places? Why does it actually matter so much? Um, and what ended up happening after that nuclear meltdown is it created all of these sustainability challenges. Uh, all the organic material in the community just sapped up all of the uh, yeah, nuclear waste. And so Japan had to just scoop like a couple feet of that topsoil and they put it into these giant trash bags. Well, now you just have all these trash bags full of soil with like radioactive material in it. And, you know, the kind of question is, what do you do with this? So we're meeting with people at Japan's Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, we're meeting with the nuclear physicists themselves to talk to them like, hey, you had a meltdown. Everyone in the community is angry. What are your thoughts now about being a nuclear engineer? Um, so it's like really exciting to be able to talk to all of these different stakeholders and policymakers and community leaders that are bringing people back into the community. Um, if you care at all about Japan, food, culture, we do a lot of that on here. We'll, um, yeah, have a tea ceremony, go to Tokyo. We'll hike the Japanese Alps. Um, you'll see in the middle here, there's actually a group of students that are standing underneath a nuclear core. This is near impossible to do. I don't know if anyone already has this on their bucket list of things that they've already done. The reason why we're able to do it is because it is now safe as they decommission this nuclear waste, uh, this nuclear power plant. And so you're able to walk under there and see the actual facility. And why did this one nuclear power plant not melt down, whereas the other one did? Um, so yeah, as Fukushima is shifting towards 100% renewable by 2040, this is sort of how you can look as a case study of what if the United States or Canada, right, just said, you know, by 2040, 2050, we wanna be 100% renewable. What would have to change? What would have to happen? What would be the same in Japan? What would not be different? And um, yeah, basically what's the context of nuclear and renewable energy? I'll pause there. Those are two countries. I barely touched on them. Thanks for listening about that. But I wanna throw it over to Riley who has a lot better stories than I. Riley, talk to us about the Nepal program. What happened? How'd you get there? What was it like? Give us everything. Okay, so Nepal, I can I can go on all day, but I'll try and uh, summarize it for you the best I can. Um, so we flew into Nepal from um, Kuwait, and then um, we landed in Kathmandu. And I took a well. Funny thing is, before they before they picked me up, I had to exchange some money and get some money. And I wanted to exchange 100 U.S. dollars for uh, rupees. And um, I stopped in the airport and I was asking all these people, like, hey, like, because I didn't know who to trust. I didn't know who was going to get me out of my money. And so I stopped in the airport and uh, he was like, oh, yeah, I got you. I got you. And so he exchanged my 100 for rupees. And then I met the cab driver outside and I said, is this, is this right? Like, is this the right exchange rate? And he was like, yeah, yeah, you're fine. I was like, okay. So then we went to this really cool place in Kathmandu. It's called the Kathmandu Guest House. Um, a lot of famous people have actually stayed there uh, while they traveled to Nepal. Uh, it's really nice, enclosed, um, full amenities, everything like that. But um, so we stayed in Kathmandu for about probably about five, six days and then went to the offsite project where we installed uh, solar panels, the microgrid systems. But I'll talk a little bit about Kathmandu first. Um, in Kathmandu, the first day I actually met this kid named Jackson. He's actually construction science management major as well which is a crazy thing he was the first person I met um he lives in Seattle but um we got some food and then we went to this monkey temple which was really cool it's it's actually that temple right there that you can see on the slides um and there's just monkeys everywhere jumping around dogs everywhere it's really cool uh people are really nice and there's this big fountain that you can throw money in as well um let's see what else the next couple of days, we, we really just explored and, and bought some things and ate really good food. We were trying a, a lot of good food. Um, nothing really hurt my stomach. Uh, I know some people don't like to eat crazy things while they're overseas or in different places, but I like to try it all. Um, they, they had a lot of like goat meat over there. They focus on goat because they can't eat uh, beef, but it was really good, really good. They actually had really good pizza over there too, which surprised me. 
Um, but anyways, those first couple of days we just explored, it's all like a bunch of temples. Um, and then we made our way to, oh, sorry. Okay, I thought my zoom went out. But uh, we made our way to the village. It was about a five hour drive from Kathmandu outside of the capital. Um, and uh, it was a little bumpy, but we made our way out there and we were greeted by the villagers. Uh, as soon as we got there, they were really welcoming. You can see Jackson right there in the top picture with uh, the, the village lady, he's blessing her. And they put, um, what are the, John, what are the things where they, when you go to like Hawaii and they put the flowers around your neck? What are yeah, the Laos, or yeah. Laos, yeah, I can't say it. <laughs> I don't think they call it that, but that's what it was. It was really, really beautiful flowers and stuff like that they put around his neck. It was, it was a warm welcome. Um, so we stayed out there for a couple of days. The first day uh, we looked at a site. If you see Sabrina right here in this picture, the big blown up one in the middle, that's the site right there. It's about like probably 40 yards off the river to the right. Um, and those solar panels weren't set up yet. There was actually a backhoe out there that was digging a well. And so once the well was done, dug, then we could start. Um, we had all the equipment. It was stowed away in one of the villagers' houses out there. And the next morning we, we towed it all out there. We did as much as we could. Uh, we, went, we did everything from digging the holes, assembling the, the structure for the solar panels, the microgrid systems and actually putting the solar panels on and getting everything to run smoothly. So actually the solar panels weren't for power to the village. They were to power a water pump that pumped water from this river right here. A uh, fun fact before I go on, this river, the road to the left, it leads up to Mount Everest. And unfortunately I didn't get to see Mount Everest, but it's another reason that I can go back. Uh, the day that I was supposed to fly to Mount Everest, it was canceled because of some storms, but it's okay. It's another reason to go back, but anyways, so once we assembled uh, the solar panels, we brought them out, uh, we dug holes, filled them with concrete, put the structure in, wired everything up. Uh, this, I think it was an array of 17 or 18 panels. Um, and we, we put them on there. We dug a hole all the way up the side of this mountain to the left, ran the pump all the way up and gravity fed it down to the village for like uh, agricultural purposes, um, plumbing, stuff like that. Um, maybe a little bit of drinking water, but mostly they use it for, for their crops. Uh, let's see. Before prelude, before we had to take some classes. We went to Kathmandu University, which is which is really cool. They had some really cool professors there that are really knowledgeable about everything that's going on in Nepal. Um, they they suffering from from electrical outages like a lot. Like when we were there, we took classes at Kathmandu University. We took about two or three of them. One was in microgrid systems, which showed us all the electrical work for these solar panels and how to assemble them. And the other one was based around sustainability in Nepal and some water issues that they were having. Um, but the teachers and stuff, professors and Kishore and our guides, they, they, they really informed us a lot about what was going on and really taught us how what we were doing was gonna impact this village and the people around them once the word got out. Um, so. Give Power is, is doing this a lot in different different places around the world, not just Nepal. And yeah, it's really it's really impactful. But the classes really taught us how to assemble all of these. So we assembled it and we all gathered up on the last day that we were in the uh, village, turned the power on and waited for the water to spew out the pump at the top and then come down. It was really cool. All the villagers were really excited and really grateful for what we did. Uh, but the village is probably my favorite part. The city was beautiful, but the village getting time to, to spend time with uh, the villagers, the elders, the, the young kids, the teenagers that are probably like the same age as me. They are really cool. Uh, some of them spoke English, some of them didn't. Some some of them you just had to, to vibe with, vibe it out. Um, it was really fun, it was really impactful. It definitely, it definitely sparked my interest in sustainability um, as far as travel goes and as far as construction goes as well, because that's my major, construction science. Some of you as well, I see Branson here and Zach. Um, some other of you I haven't met yet, uh, but I'm sure you'll see me around Lee Hall once we get back to in-person classes. If you have any questions, ask me about it. But I'm definitely gonna be continuing to uh, uh, implement sustainability in, into my career, whether it's here or overseas. Um, I, I really wanna work overseas in the future. Um, I probably won't start out that way, but I would love to work for an international company and build some cool projects over there that are definitely sustainable. Um, I definitely think sustainability is a rising issue as it comes to construction and engineering. And um, 
whoever is interested in it, really. I mean, I think a lot of people need to focus on it because, I mean, you can see what's going on right now, wildfires, water issues. It's definitely something that we need to focus on. And, and Nepal really changed my mindset when I went there. So I've done a lot of traveling, but I didn't travel in this way to benefit somebody the way that we did. And so once you're there firsthand, like he was saying, I'm standing on the glacier and, and realizing the effects of global warming. When you're standing over there and realizing the effects that they have, they're having power outages every day. Um, so climate change is definitely affecting them as well. It's, it's definitely worth going, definitely worth seeing. Um, yeah. and, and let alone not, not just the villages and, and um, building the solar panels. Building the solar panels was really cool. Uh, seeing the backhoe out there was really cool because that's construction science major. It was all relatable. But the travel as well. The travel is really fun. The green program sets up a, a lot of good, good places to eat, travel, See, uh, we also went to um, Kathmandu's first like um, hydro water pump plant. Um, and we hiked up this really big hill and saw the beautiful backdrop in the background after we saw this hydro plant. Um, let's see, what else did we, we did? We did a whole lot, huh? a lot, a lot. Yeah, no, it's funny you said that, Riley, because a lot of people will ask me, how much can you really do in eight to 10 days? And yeah, um, yeah if you're interested, oh, go ahead. Sorry, eight days. All right, it was 10 days actually, but. We did a lot in 10 days. I remember looking back and I was like, dang, we've, we've already, I feel like I've been here for a while. So <laughs> much, but it was fun. Yeah. Was fun. And that's kind of our goal. I'm glad that you experienced that too, Riley, um, of just being able to have so much and have a really transformative experience. Um, yeah, if, if you're interested to connect with Riley, we'll ask some questions at the very end. Uh, otherwise, if you are of a different background or you're curious about, hey, what does it look like to be an electrical engineer? I can always connect you with an alumni at any different university, maybe Clemson or other ones. Um, to hear about what their experience is like. So yeah, our alumni are really great, love to connect, and Riley already extended that, so please take them up on the offer. Um, cool, uh, Riley, we're gonna talk more, and I'm excited to hear more about the experience, but first, uh, let me chat a little bit about Iceland as well. Uh, this program, probably the most popular of all of them, is studying renewable energy innovation and sustainability. So Iceland, if you're not familiar, is running on almost 100%. They're in the top 90% of renewable energy for their entire country. So this is kind of like the dream, the utopia. So students who go here love visiting and seeing the technology, the policy, the culture, like how does it work? How does this place exist? And behind that curtain are also a couple challenges too, things that you wouldn't expect that they're facing and would be really helpful, you know, hopefully one day the United States is 100% renewable. Uh, it's good to know what those challenges look like. So Iceland here, you're taking classes at Reykjavik University. Uh, we haven't spoken too much about the professors, but um, yeah, at least Riley, I know one of your professors in Nepal, he wrote Nepal's energy policy, the people in Iceland here, uh, one of the people who teaches the geothermal class, we call her the queen of geothermal because uh, literally everyone from around the world comes to learn from her. Um, so yeah, it's exciting that in this one, the three main renewable energy technologies that we focus on or energies is geothermal, hydroelectric, and uh, biodiesel. How the days sort of go here and really with a lot of our programs is we want you to study it in the classroom, see it in the field, and then yeah, go on an adventure all in one day. And so an example of that is you would study geothermal energy in the morning. You would go to the largest geothermal facility in Iceland, which is actually carbon net negative, still blows my mind every time I say it, um, and learn about how are they advancing their technology. So after touring with those industry professionals, then later we go to a residential town where we see them running on all geothermal energy. Uh, you'll eat food there. You can tell me if it tastes any different, but it's really talking with those community leaders and seeing, you know, how are they sort of working with renewable energy there in that town. And then we'll go hiking into the hot springs, which is really fun. Just being able to bathe in the hot springs in Iceland, which is incredible. Google any photos and I promise you'll be wowed. Um, but otherwise, like we do want to see geothermal energy in nature and think about that entire cycle from nature, residential, industry, and historical sort of academic background. We tie it in just rinsing and repeating every day with different energy. So you'll go to two or three hydroelectric facilities, um, the biodiesel one, and that geothermal. So happy to connect you with alumni that have gone there. Again, we want you to experience firsthand the effects of climate change. And this is a program that students have really enjoyed. 
Um, I, I guess I haven't mentioned this yet. Um, all of our programs, like the cost for them and everything is all inclusive in country. So you do have to pay for the flight. But other than that, once you get to the airport, we're there to pick you up, unless you go a couple days early. Uh, we'll pick you up at the airport uh, and drop you off everything in between, all of your adventure tours and you, know, you getting 1.5 graduate credits here from Iceland and the other universities, the time with your professors, industry professionals, um, all the guides are local, uh, and, and that's a great thing to be able to learn from people who actually live there. I think for your program, Riley, you had a couple extra people since uh, it was a pilot program, but now it's running with all people in Nepal. Um, and yeah, I don't know, what were your guides like? Did you enjoy sort of having them on the program? Oh, yeah, they, they, they made the program. Uh, we had uh, Kishore. He, he was pretty much the head guide. He communicated with Melissa a lot. Um, we had Siddhi and we had Robin. And also, or they were our main guides to Nepal. They knew about Nepal. They lived there. Um, and then we also had Erla, who is who is um, the local guide for the Iceland program. Yeah, she bounced over because she was really awesome. pumped about the pilot program. But uh, yeah, I'm glad that you got to meet all of them. Um, sweet. Uh, another main part of all of our programs is the Capstone Project. Uh, and I know you mentioned it a little bit before Riley, but to give people a background, Capstone Project here is you coming with your backgrounds, your passion, and bringing everyone's different sort of um, interests into one incredible project. It's a little bit of dreaming, it's a little bit of practicality, but we're asking you to pick a real world challenge in sustainability and create a real world business solution. Um, it's actually kind of funny because now there have been enough alumni that have taken this capstone project and done further research or actually turned it into an actual business. Um, like two guys who went on the Iceland program, they went back to Chicago and they are now collecting restaurant waste um, and converting it to biofuels or another person who started a volunteer organization down in Costa Rica with wind energy. So yeah, if you come on the program, like that's how real we want your capstone project to be. And you're obviously practicing all of these skills you see on the slide here. But um, yeah, maybe a better example. Riley, can you tell us more about what your capstone project looks like? And yeah, like who did you work from? What did you sort of add to it? What was it like for you? Right. So um, we had a group about, there's three of us, or excuse me, four of us. Um, one, one of them, one, one person in our group, his name was Sushan. He was from. See that worked. Uh, some projects um, basically focused around uh, road work, um, and we did our project on plastic roads. They're pre-modulated roads um, that that can be inserted in, come in, come in inserts. Instead of you pouring uh, asphalt and pavement or concrete for sidewalks and stuff like that, uh, we came with the idea to do like modulated roads. So basically, they're big square chunks of roads that you can just pop in, pop out whenever they, they get used up. Um, they're hollow, but they're really stru structurally strong. You can run plumbing, um, wiring, conduit um, through them. And then also we came up with, with uh, later on down the road, whenever technology uh, increases, which I'm sure Elon Musk is gonna do, um, we implemented uh, electrical charging in the roads too. So uh, cars don't even have to stop to uh, charge up. Um, we presented it at Kathmandu University, excuse me, uh, in front of our, our team that we went with and in front of the professors there. And uh, it was really cool. It was really cool. We, we uh, hypothesized on it, worked on it for about three days um, before we went to the village. Well, basically five days before we went to the village. Then we went to the village, worked there, came back, uh, worked on it again, and presented it. And then other groups, they did all kinds of stuff. Ours, we based, we, we kind of already had a basic knowledge of what we were going to do, but we did see, um, they already have plastic roads in like Germany, but they're not really implementing them. And um, they're, they're not as like, I'm trying to figure out how to put this. They're not as like customizable as you would want them to be um, for like turns and, and neighborhoods and stuff like that. They would mainly work on like straightaways. Um, so we were trying to figure out, implement a way that, that we could change it up. We also, um, figured out that we can run water through them for drainage issues and stuff like that. So places won't be flooded. But yeah, that was basically the gist of my project. Yo, John, I think you're muted. Uh, can you hear me now? 
Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I, I like that. You took a, a model also from Germany, which is what a lot of people will look at, like what is happening in other places? How do we account for culture and um, policy and everything else as well? Um, so yeah, I'm glad that you were able to sort of come with sort of an example and then uh, build upon it. That's awesome, Riley. Um, sweet. Another thing that I mentioned before, um, was all the different adventure and culture pieces. Uh, so if you haven't traveled before, we would love to have you on the green program. Something that's really nice is you just get to the airport and then you can just sort of be a sponge and accept it all and just like learn, learn, learn. Um, if you have traveled to lots of different places like Riley had before the program, like this is a totally different experience as well. Um, but either way, whether it is your first time or um, you've been abroad many times before, there is something great about growing in your own leadership through adventure and culture. Um, so yeah, we think that this is an important piece to our programs because it does expand your comfort zone and sort of fosters that personal growth. Um, Riley, did you feel like on your program, I know that you had traveled before, but like, did was your comfort zone expanded? Did you feel like you did grow personally? Uh, yeah, so I was going to touch on that. Um, so with my other trips that I traveled, um, I went with Hewitt People Ambassador Program, like I said, and we met with everybody that we were going to travel with months before we traveled and we studied and, and had our itinerary ready and everything like that. And this we had our itinerary ready, but I, I really didn't know anybody going into this trip. Like I knew them virtually, but I didn't know them. So my comfort, I'm normally comfortable around meeting new people and speaking publicly, but like this was a little bit scary for me because it was going to Nepal, like further, further, furthest out of all the countries that I've traveled to. I won't say that I'm, I was scared. I was just a little bit anxious, but it definitely, uh, definitely helped me grow uh, personally um, in my comfort zone, getting to know people and these cultures as well. Also the, the culture in Nepal, they're really accepting and stuff. They, they really like, um, uh, Westerners, so to say. So that was really cool. Um, but yeah, I got along with everybody on my trip. They're, they're really interested in sustainability and they're probably going to be big time people coming up in the future. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Hey, I want to talk about COVID as well. Uh, I feel like this is super important. Uh, so basically, as you know, that right now, since COVID and the pandemic has hit, uh, travel has been quite difficult. So on the green program's end for each of our program destinations, we're talking to all the people there locally, looking at the World Health Organization, CDC, DOS, and basically making an assessment for every single program, um, depending on each of them. So yeah, right now, um, if you apply to a green program, know that it's non-binding. Uh, I think a lot of people are afraid. What if I apply to the springtime, the summertime? What if I want to transfer to next December? Just know that if you apply to a program, it doesn't lock you in. You pay nothing. It just is for you to talk about your story and, and see you know, where the green program might fit in it. So if you want to transfer to any future programs, there's no problem. Um, but let's say that it does happen and your program does get postponed, uh, like it has in the past, basically the couple options that you'll have, uh, when I say couple, I mean, there are many, so you can participate in just an online course. We actually have many of them that we're developing. We've won awards for them. Uh, we're pretty excited about a lot of them too. Uh, one of them is the learn now travel later course, which I'll touch about touch on in a second. Basically you take your classes over the winter and then travel in the summer. Um, you can always transfer to a future program, super flexible and easy. It's no problem there. Um, or let's say you're like, Hey, I want to go all the way in December and you don't even have those dates yet. Well, we can offer you a full program credit there as well. Um, so lots of options for you. We're going to work with you to make sure that something works. Um, but let's talk about these different programs that are innovative and new and different. A lot of people have just sort of canceled everything and we don't want to do that. We don't think that it makes sense to just sort of like postpone everything indefinitely. We want you to get some of these experiences. So if you were on this call and you're like, hey, December to January, like I want to take a class on renewable energy innovation in Iceland. Um, that's something that you can totally do. You'll have online office hours with your professors. Some of our courses are live um, and you'll be able to complete it all at your own pace. And then you'll be able to travel in the summertime. Um, it actually, you end up taking a couple extra classes in geothermal energy and electro power grid systems for the Iceland course, for instance. Um, and then when you travel abroad, you know, you're spending less time actually in the classroom and more time in the industry visits and the adventure piece. So a lot of students actually are opting for this because it's a cheaper option and also you get more out of it. 
So if this is something you're interested in, happy to chat with you about it. Some people are just like, John, I want an online program only. Uh, we just released one the other day and enrollment closes because I think it starts in November. I can't remember the exact day. And it's actually the two classes we have right now is the ethics of sustainable development. Uh, that one is taught actually by one of your professors, Riley, Dr. Sager. Um, another one is sustainable um, indigenous knowledge and sustainability in Peru, thinking about how does this, like indigenous knowledge impact sustainability and who has the power to capitalize and, and monetize and really gain sort of the, the, the profits that come from using that um, while also respecting it, you know? And then we have our online class in Peru where it's for the water resource management program. And then we have it for the innovative um, technology around renewable energy. So lots of options for you if you just want to take an online program. Um, and you'll get full credit for the Iceland and Peru course for these other ones. They're actually certificate programs, um, and that is appealing to some people as well, uh, just because the price is a lot cheaper without the college credit. Cool. Here's just an example of our impact. I didn't even add the mo more, most recent sort of like awards that we've won. Um, the awards really don't mean a lot to us. The reason why we're really proud is just the impact of what our programs do for students. So go online, talk to an alumni, talk to anyone like that will be sort of the test of who the green program really is. So I'm very confident to connect you with absolutely anyone um, and excited for you to, you know, meet them. You're probably curious too, like John, eight to 10 days sounds like a blast would be at such like a excited state when you get back. But what is the long term impact of our programs? Um, well, here actually like 95% of our students experience a sustainability related shift. So for a lot of people, they didn't really know about sustainability or they knew about it. It was just a passion and they didn't know how to take action. Well, that's kind of the purpose of our programs to sort of inspire action and really be able to help you feel like you can make a difference in the world. Um, Riley, you touched on this a little, but did you feel like you sort of had a sustainability related shift yourself after the green program? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So in construction science, we take a lot of like sustainability related courses. Like right now, me and Brent and possibly Zach are taking a um, sustainability and construction course. Um, we also take environmental systems. Um, but with that being said, me going on the trip definitely, definitely hiked my interest in sustainability. My career. Career. I definitely want to implement, implement it into my career after experiencing the green program of going to Nepal and dealing with uh, microgrid systems such as the solar panels and making building cool. more green in general. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I'm so glad that that has impacted you in those ways. Um, I feel like for me, when I studied abroad in Thailand and learned about sustainable development, it just shifted everything. I ditched my pre-med plans, which I'm glad I did. Otherwise I would be in medicine right now. And that would be tough. If you want to go to med school, go for it. You've got this, but, uh, I'm glad that I did not. Um, so yeah, I'm glad that both you and I, Riley just sort of had that experience. Um, you'll also see on here that four out of five people say that the or alumni say employers have asked them about the green program. Reason being is like when it's on your resume that you've actually had this experience abroad in sustainability, they know like, oh, you're serious. You care about sustainability and you get to talk about your capstone project. And a lot of people get to brag about how the green program really did refine their purpose and make them more confident in, in clarity around like where they want to go, which as you all imagine from job interviews, internships, like you need to know who you are and where you're going, or at least like a target. And the green program has really helped people narrow that down. Um, but yeah, Riley, I don't know. You just mentioned about how it helped you with the sustainability related shift, but do you feel like your, I don't know, like grander purpose, professionally, personally, or academically, do you feel like it was impacted at all? Or how was it impacted if so? Um, yeah, I feel like just going on the trip and being exposed to real world problems that are going on outside of our little bubble or our big bubble, whatever you want to call it. Um, it definitely, it definitely, whether in, in my career or, or my life, definitely I'm I'm definitely focusing more on more sustainable issues and more issues that I, I would have overlooked um, if I haven't, hadn't learned about the things I did and hadn't seen it face to face. Like for example, in Nepal, um, they have no, um, they have no like formal way of getting rid of trash. Uh, no trash like 
truck system, nobody that drives around, takes it to a dump. They don't really have dumps there. They have, I think they have one that we drove by that was nothing there but old cars. Literally, I remember we were driving somewhere, and the kid just walked out of his house with a bag of trash and just threw it. And so, like, issue issues just as simple as that. Like, their, their water's not as good as it needs to be. It's polluted. Stuff drains into the water. Small issues like that. Like, I know we, we, don't, we don't see it a lot here in the United States. Um, for example, maybe maybe like Flint, but it's nothing compared to, to what they have going on in Nepal. And to see it is just, it's kind of like, I, I don't even know what to say about it. When I first saw it, I, I could just look. And we actually debated about it a little bit in our capstone project and discussed if we wanted to make a project centered around Nepal and their um, trash removal um, initiatives that they're trying to initiate, or trying to start, excuse me. Um, but we decided to go with the plastic roads. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely shifted me a lot. Yeah. I'll say too, Riley, at least for me, there was similar things with waste management in Thailand and, you know, some of it what, like confused me, frustrated me and made me also think about how we do waste management in the U S right. I think it's just like you see it a place and then you're able to sort of analyze, you know, where is it different? Where is it the same when we see, a lot of waste that maybe happens in different ways as well in the United States. Um, so yeah, I'm glad that you sort of saw that and are now more aware of it. Well, great. Um, last thing I guess I wanted to mention are just like who are our alumni. Uh, we have a bunch of these awesome places that alumni are working at. Reason I mentioned them is just because, yeah, we care about you after you get back from the program, want to be able to offer you career, professional career resources and professional development ones. And um, if you want to connect with alumni that are working at these different organizations, we've had a lot of alumni that will send us job postings, internships. We forward them every Friday. Um, and then that as hopefully will connect you to someone in the door doing some great sustainability work and um, yeah, get you alongside that because networks are important and we want you to leverage that. So when I went on my program, I came back with no network. Uh, so this is something I really like about the 3,200 plus alumni. Um, people from the green program, where are they coming from? 400 different universities, 70 different countries. It's both undergraduate, graduate, young professionals, recent grads, um, and there's ambassadors like Riley, as well as advocates as well of people who just want to talk about the green program and spread sustainability news. So if you want to hear about that, happy to chat with you. TGP at Clemson, just want to mention this real fast. We've had 26 people from Clemson, both environmental, chemical, mat sci, construction science and management, microbio. Um, so yeah, basically lots of people from different backgrounds. Uh, if you're interested in credit and how it transfers, Definitely will want to just go and meet with your advisor with the syllabus and ask them how the credit might transfer. Uh, for some students, it's super easy. For other students, uh, they don't get any credit from it. Um, and instead, they sign up just for the program and the international sort of graduate level credit that they do receive some of our locations. But otherwise, I know you're all sitting there. We're going to ask some questions. I want to encourage you to apply today, tonight. Um, actually, like depends on you. It can take 20 minutes, an hour, but remember like none of it is uh, binding. And I think it is pretty great that you just get to reflect on what your journey has been. And yeah, I look forward to reading sort of those applications. Um, second, just want to leave you with this quote before we ask questions to Riley. Uh, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. I feel like Margaret Mead just is really breaking it down to something more simple. Um, and yeah, just excited for all of you on this journey is if it's hopefully the green program, awesome. If it's another piece of your future, that's that's great. And I just wanna encourage you in what you're doing and your thoughtfulness and being here is important. So thanks everyone for attending. Uh, but yeah, I'd like to sort of turn it over to some questions. If you want to unmute yourself, feel free to ask it. If you have your video off, I told you that you have to ask a question in the chat bar. Um, and we'll try to get to any of the ones that have already been asked. But um, yeah, I'm okay with awkward silences. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question to Riley or myself. Could you go over how it would work with learning first and then traveling again? Yeah, sure. And I'll send you the recording too as well, Aaron, but I appreciate you asking. So you would take all of your classes online at your own pace. Um, 
And then after finishing just the academic portion, like for the Iceland program, then you would travel in the summer time and you would complete all of the industrial sort of tours where you're meeting with the professors, um, the industry professionals and the um, local guides going on the adventure activities and whatnot and learning about culture, eating, travel. So we would do all of that in the summer, either in May or August. Good question. Um, yeah, Anthony, I see you asking also about cost. Um, yeah, Riley, for you, when you paid for the Nepal trip, um, yeah, how much did it cost and what was sort of included in that as well? Uh, right, so I think y'all yeah, do a couple different payment options. Um, I did the, I think it was like three payments or two payments split up, not all at once. Uh, I think the trip was about, from you guys, was about 4300 Um and then I also paid for my flight, um, which flight to flight is going to cost a little bit more. And um, for Nepal, it was a little bit more, but I, I was willing to pay for it and go. Um, but um, since I did the, the multiple payment plans, you, you don't have to put it put it all down to begin with. You can put a deposit down, pay, pay up until your trip. Um, and I will say uh, the green program, working with them leading up to my trip, they were very flexible um, as it came to payments and they worked with me one time. So anything like that, anything that you need to be worked with there, they're pretty flexible. And for the triple I was there, I, I probably took, I probably ended up taking like $500 just in spending cash. And now it's probably a little bit too much anyways. And I didn't spend it all. So it's, def it's definitely worth it. Yeah. Regardless of the price. And I think I, I didn't mention this, but all of your housing, food, all of those things are yep. sort of taken care of. Uh, so if you're going to bring any extra money, like that's for souvenirs or like, I don't know, specialty coffees, I'm not sure. Um, and yeah, basically everything else is included in country. The the main thing that you're paying for is your flight. Um, also, uh, I believe some of, the payment, some of the payment that you that you're paying is also going towards whatever issue or case study that you're working in the program. So like some of my payment went towards the allocation of the solar panels and the microgrid systems. Yeah. And actually we have sponsors that also are working to, to bring down that cost too for the solar panels because they are not cheap uh, and also the continued maintenance as well. When we look at the Iceland program and other ones as well, we try to select mostly locally owned and women owned businesses because we're one as well. And we just care about that, it matters a lot to us. Um, so rather than you going to a cheap hostel in Iceland owned by someone from Spain, you're going to a small hotel that is run by this Icelandic family that will cook you dinners and sort of teach you language. Um, so that's sort of where we're thinking about the local economy and traveling, right? Um, that's important to us. Uh, I see someone asked about scholarships. The green program does offer scholarships, but it depends year by year and season by season. Right now, there are no scholarships available, um, but if any do become available, I always send them out to the accepted students. So feel free, you know, also if you apply, I'll send those out to you. Other students have found scholarships as well from their university or other organizations. So part of my job is to walk you through that process. Um, so yeah, if you can't sort of pay for the 4,300 tomorrow, that's no problem. Most people on this call and myself cannot. Uh, so we work with you for flexible spending and um, payment plans and then looking for other funding as well. Um, at the Green Program, let's say you pay your full program fee and you get a scholarship, we'll refund you that amount of that scholarship that you've now overpaid. So that gives you that flexibility. Um, cool. Other questions in the chat. If your video is off, you have to ask. If your video is on, you don't have to ask questions, but we would love it if you did. Any questions for Riley or myself? I know Brent got a question. Come on, Brent. And Matt. Um, while we're waiting for questions, just kind of curious if you were to travel to any of the green program destinations, Japan, Peru, Nepal, or Iceland, uh, just write in the chat. I'm kind of curious about which one sort of stuck out to you the most. Peru, Iceland. Awesome. Going for Japan. Thanks for joining us. Oh yeah, Zach, you've been here. Um, yeah, Japan program is going to happen in next May. We're excited about that. 
Yeah, thank you, Brent and Anthony, for giving Nepal some love. <laughs> cool. So it looks like people are interested in all the different locations. That's awesome. If you apply to the green program, you can select multiple locations. And um, even if you apply for the Japan program and you and I talk about it and you're like, hey, actually, I think I want to switch over to Iceland. I'm happy to do that for you as well. Cool. How about before we sign off? Because I know we're at our time limit. Uh, can someone close us out with one more question? Something that you're dying to ask? You think other people are curious about? Um, I know there's a bunch of you. Thanks everyone who kept your video on as well. You rock. Excited to see all of your faces. I hope you're doing well. Um, but yeah, anyone want to ask the last question and then uh, we'll sign off. I see people like awkward smiling. Yeah, I know. Well, if not, um, if you guys have any questions um, while you're on campus or virtual, I know I don't go to, to Clemson's campus except for once a week, and I, I haven't really gone yet. So um, if you do see me on campus, don't hesitate to stop me and ask questions. Um, I'm mostly in Lee Hall, but I, I do venture out for other classes. Um, I'll be in the library. I'll be in Cooper. Um, email me. DM me on Instagram. Hit me on LinkedIn, any type of way you want to connect, shoot me an email, contact, and, and we can connect. <clears throat> yeah, Bradley, can you throw your email or Instagram yeah. handle, whatever it is, into the chat so people can see? Uh, mine's John, J-O-N, at thegreenprogram.com. Feel free to just send me a quick email with any questions. Happy to answer it.